Good morning. I'm Dr. Ben Muller. I'm the Director of Interventional Endoscopy Services at California Pacific Medical Center in San Francisco. It's a pleasure for me to be with you here today. Uh, we are webcasting, and I'm going to speak to you on the topic of Waldorf necroses, evolving treatment algorithms for Waldorf pancreatic necroses. We abbreviate this WON, W-O-N. My disclosure is I am the inventor of the Axios Lumen Opposing Metal Stent and its delivery systems, and I am a consultant for Boston Scientific uh, in the uh, capacity of advising them on this platform. Let's start with a definition of Waldorf necroses. It is defined as a mature, encapsulated collection of pancreatic and or peripancreatic necroses with mixed liquid and solid contents. Well, this is a term that was introduced about a decade ago, and it is now widely embraced as the official designation uh, for patients that have cavities with the mature wall resulting from necrotizing pancreatitis. There have been many prior descriptors that were used in the literature. Uh, the most common is organized necroses, but we also saw the term post-necrotic fluid collection, post-necrosis pseudocyst, pseudocyst associated with necroses. Now you'll notice that the term pseudocyst appears in a few of these descriptors, and this reflects some of the confusion that has uh, pervaded uh, the literature, namely the confusion between a pseudocyst and a Waldorf necrosis. And this is why in 2012, the Atlanta classification was revised to distinguish four distinct types of fluid collections. An acute fluid collection, an acute necrotic collection, a pseudocyst, and Waldorf necroses. Now, why this differentiation? It reflects our better understanding of the natural history of the disease. If we have a patient with acute pancreatitis, that patient, in 85% of the cases, will go on to develop interstitial pancreatitis. So no necrotizing component. That, in turn, may develop into an acute fluid collection. And if this persists for over four weeks, it will develop into a pseudocyst. That pseudocyst will contain only fluid. If, on the other hand, the patient develops necrotizing pancreatitis, and that will occur in 15% of the cases, this may develop into an acute necrotic collection. And if that persists for more than four weeks, this will develop into Waldorf necroses containing both fluid and necroses. Now, what's critical is the age of the fluid collection. If it is older than four weeks since the onset of acute pancreatitis and it has developed a mature wall, then it is either a pseudocyst or a WAN. How do we differentiate a pseudocyst from a WAN on our imaging studies? CT scan is usually where we start. We use a contrast enhanced CT scan and both of these will show a completely encapsulating wall. You can see this for the pseudocyst as well as for the WAN. The pseudocyst will have a homogeneous, low attenuation fluid density, as you can see here. So we will not see any enhancing areas within the cavity. By contrast, a WAN will be heterogeneous and it will have some uh, non-enhancing and enhancing uh, areas. The MRI is a far superior imaging study to detect solid debris or necroses. Unfortunately, it's not easily obtained uh, and it's costly, so it is not usually, it's usually done only when one specifically desires to quantify the amount of necroses at present. But on these T2 weighted MRI images, you can very nicely see the distinction between liquid and solid material. In one study, the sensitivity on T2 weighted MRI was 100% compared to 25% for the contrast enhanced CT scan. 
Now, there are other, there are other advantages to MRI. There's no nephrotoxicity since we don't use contrast. There's no radiation. Uh, we do visualize the pancreatic duct, the MRCP component. That may show disruption uh, or a obstruction, a blockage stricture. Uh, and we see the CBD on the gallbladder to look for stones. That may be the etiology of the pancreatitis. This Atlanta classification provides the foundation upon which the treatment algorithms are based. And we refer to this as the three Ds. If we are dealing with an acute fluid or necrotic collection, then we delay. We don't want to intervene for the fir during the first four weeks. If it's a pseudocyst, it's been around for more than four weeks, then we drain. And if it's a WAN, duration more than four weeks, then we debreed. What's important to emphasize is that any acute collection, whether just fluid or with necroses, should be left untouched. There are rare exceptions. For example, a patient with abdominal compartment syndrome or some type of a catastrophic clinical presentation where you have to intervene early. This is the landmark study from 1997 that randomized patients between early surgical intervention, this was open necrosectomy, and late, uh, waiting four weeks. The mortality dropped by some three-fourths uh, if you waited four weeks, from 56% to 15%. The morbidity dropped from 72% to 39%. Now, there have been many subsequent studies that have validated these results. So the consensus is that we do not intervene uh, during the first four weeks. If we're dealing with the pseudocyst, this is more than four weeks old and it contains only fluid, then we drain that collection and the gold standard has been surgical drainage by creating a cyst enterostomy um, or a cyst gastrostomy. We can also drain the collection with a percutaneous a catheter and we can also drain the, uh, the collection internally. So percutaneous is obviously external, but we could do this internally by placing a stent. I was very privileged to be in Hamburg working uh, with the Nip Sanders group uh, when we performed the world's first EUS guided pseudocyst drainage in 1992. Uh, at that time, we had uh, only a 2.0 millimeter channel uh, curved linear array echo endoscope. So we had to exchange the echoendoscope for a duodenoscope for the stent placement. We punctured the cyst with a diathermic catheter, and then we exchanged the two scopes over uh, a wire and placed the, uh, the, the stent. We call this the Seligiger technique um, that is now widely disseminated. Uh, we first access under EUS guidance with a 19-gauge needle, pass our wire through the needle, we dilate the tract, usually with the balloon, but you can use a bougie, and then we place a stent or multiple stents. Uh, typically, we'll place at least two with the idea that we'll get some drainage alongside the stents as well as through the stent. This is an important study uh, published in 2013 that randomized patients between endoscopic drainage of pseudocysts versus the then gold standard surgical cyst gastrostomy. It's a small study. Um, and it specifically excluded patients with WAN, but in the endo group, um, uh, there was a significantly shorter hospital stay by four days and a lower cost by about 8,000, by more than $8,000. You can see that uh, represented in the table down here. This was statistically uh, significant. Now, I will uh, emphasize that the endoscopic treatment consisted of two plastic stents uh, drained. So there's there's, uh, there, there, there's no debridement or anything like that performed. Wands were specifically excluded. Uh, interestingly, the endoscopic group had no recurrence of pseudocyst, but the surgical group did have one recurrence. If we have necroses inside of the cavity, then we debride. The gold standard, again, has been surgical. Um, for 100 years, over a century, it was open debridement, uh, necrosectomy with lavage and packing. Uh, with the advent of laparoscopic surgery, then uh, this could be done laparoscopically, although this is not widely done today. It's been replaced now by video-assisted retroperitoneal debridement called a VARD. Uh, this was first described in 2001. Percutaneous drainage and debridement is possible 
It was described uh, by Freeney uh, in Seattle in 1998 using large bore catheters um, with directed debridement, so passing uh, various extraction tools like baskets through the tract uh, to debride the collection, as well as even passing a miniature endoscope through the sinus tract to perform debridement. And then we have direct endoscopic transmural debridement that was first described by my former colleague in Hamburg, Hans Seifert. Um, published in the Lancet in 2000, these are three cases. Um, all three had received endoscopic drainage procedures with plastic stents. The cavities became then, uh, the necrotic cavities became infected, so they developed infected uh, necroses and they underwent then debridement by first dilating the tract to 16 millimeters with a balloon, removing the debris with various tools, uh, baskets and snares, and then performing weekly debridement until resolution of the cavity, and the cavities did resolve in all three cases. What is critical is creating a large opening. I call that fenestration. Uh, we typically use a 15 to 18 millimeter CRE balloon uh, to create this opening um, and this allows not only the passage of the endoscope into the cavity for debridement but also a large opening for extrusion of the necroses through the opening. We can perform direct debridement uh, as you can see down here in this uh, panel, um, this, in this case using a basket. Uh, you can use snares, uh, I actually like uh, to use forceps. Uh, we can optionally place a nasal cystic catheter for continuous irrigation, uh, typically about a liter over 24 hours. You can see the catheter entering the cavity alongside pig pigtail stents here. The step-up concept uh, is really a paradigm shift. Uh, this was introduced by the T Dutch Pancreatitis Study Group. Step one is drainage, and we move to step two only if needed, which is debridement. Drainage is performed either percutaneously, external, or internal endoscopically, and debridement is performed um, either using the minimally invasive surgical VARD technique uh, or uh, endoscopic uh, debridement. Um, open necrosectomy has really fallen by the wayside, and it's only done when the VARD debridement is not sufficient. Now there are three randomized trials performed by the Dutch Pancreatitis Study Group. Each of these are truly seminal landmark papers. Uh, I'd like to spend a little bit of time reviewing them. So there's the PANTER trial, which is a step up uh, starting with drainage, moving on to debridement versus primary open necrosectomy. We have the PENGUIN trial, endoscopic necrosectomy versus surgical step up. So that means starting with VARD and then moving to open only if needed. And then the TENSION trial, which is endoscopic step up starting with drainage, moving to debridement only if needed versus surgical step up. Now the PANTER trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2010, this was uh, truly a landmark study. 88 uh, patients randomized between step up versus primary open surgery. Bear in mind that up until this time, open necrosectomy was still considered the gold standard and we needed this type of a randomized trial to really demonstrate that a less invasive approach uh, is more. In the step-up group, there was a 35% success with percutaneous drainage alone. So these patients did not just need to step up to debridement. And in the step-up group, there were fewer uh, organ failures, significantly fewer, dropping from 40% to 12%. You can see this in the table down here, as well as a significantly lower cost um, and uh, that was by an order of about 10,000 euros per patient. The Penguin trial was a small trial, just 20 patients that were random randomized, 10 in each group. Uh, surgery, surgery group went from VAR to open. The endo group had two pigtail stents as well as nasal cystic catheter irrigation performed, and all of these patients underwent the necrosectomy several days later. So this is a apples-to-apples -apples comparison of necrosectomy using a surgical approach versus endoscopic necrosectomy. And in the endo group, there were fewer organ failures significantly, as well as fewer uh, leaks, and you can see that shown here in the outcomes table uh, shown down here. The tension trial is a comparison of two step-up approaches. We have the endoscopic step-up, 
start drainage, move to debridement only if necessary, and surgical step up, again the same. Um, I'm going to take you through the randomization process which was published in 2013. The results have not yet been published um, because uh, I think that this um, is very important to know the details of how uh, these centers approach endoscopic treatment. Now they started with two plastic stents and nasocystic irrigation in all patients using at least a liter per 24 hours. That was the standard, nasocystic irrigation. It is not the standard in the U.S. It is quite prevalent in Europe to perform nasocystic irrigation. And only if the uh, irrigation and the drainage did not result in resolution did one then move to necrosectomy endoscopic after dilating the tract to 18 millimeters and then afterwards placing, replacing two pigtail stents and performing continuous ongoing nasocystic irrigation. Now, in those patients randomized to surgery, they all started with drainage percutaneous. And that was stepped up to more aggressive drainage by upsizing the catheters and placing more catheters until it was absolutely necessary to move on to the next level, and that was VARD. So drainage first and then debridement only if absolutely necessary. Now, the results of this were presented in abstract form at UEGW in 2016. 418 patients screened, 24 hospitals, 98 were randomized, 51 in the endo group, 47 surgical. There was no difference in the major complications. However, in the endo group, there were fewer pancreatic fistulas. Now, that's not surprising because endoscopic drainage is, of course, internal versus external using the percutaneous approach and the VARD approach. The VARD is really just a more aggressive percutaneous approach. There was also shorter hospital stay and that really should result in a cost reduction. So we look forward to the, uh, the fully published paper. I've compiled um, a number of studies here that uh, are uh, for the most part a single center. Uh, the Seifert study is multi-center European um, and the largest study. Um, but what this table shows you is that the adverse event rate is significant. It's about a third of the patients will experience adverse events, and these can be serious. Uh, we're talking about the possibility of uh, peritonitis and uh, air embolism, uh, uh, life-threatening events like this. And this is what inspired me to think about how we can make endoscopic drainage and debridement uh, safer. And in order for it to disseminate, it needs to become easier. There's simply too many steps and too many things that can go wrong with each step. So we need to simplify the procedure. We need to streamline it. We need to make it more user-friendly. We need to make it safer. This inspired me to develop um, um, the, the axial stent. Um, this slide here just summarizes the challenges that we face and it can occur at three different stages. First of all, the aggressive tract dilation um, which can result in perforation, leak and bleeding. The removal of the necroses which can lead to bleeding, perforation, air embolism and usually multiple sessions are required to completely clear the necroses. And then uh, the cyst enterostomy can uh, close down um, and, it, and, and it will if you use plastic stents because the opening, initially very large, but it will collapse down over the plastic stents and that can result in infection and sepsis. And uh, these challenges at each of these procedural stages inspired the development of the uh, lumina posi metal stent, the axial stent. And it has four key properties. Firstly, it's a, a large lumen of 15 millimeters to optimize drainage. Now, of course, Self-expandable metal stents all have large lumens, uh, but what's different is this is not a tubular stent that is used for luminal applications, whether it be enteric or biliary. It is designed for transluminal drainage and debridement. Um, so it has anchoring flanges that are lumen opposing to prevent migration, but also to serve as a port, a robust, secure port for debridement namely passing the endoscope through the stent into the cavity and then pulling the necroses uh, out and being able to 
go in and out of the cavity as needed uh, without risking dislodgement of the stent. It should have a short length that straddles only the wall to minimize any collateral damage uh, to either the cavity or the bowel wall. And it should be fully covered so that it is sealing the fistula tract that's been created, but also tamponading any bleeding that can occur uh, usually with the dilation. The electrocautery enhanced delivery system uh, is the, the, the component that allows us to simplify the procedure. So there's a stent, but the delivery of this stent in a single step is also what's unique about this system. And the ideal is to be able to enter into the cavity and immediately deploy the stent without any over-the-wire exchanges. Every time you exchange over the wire, and that's the Seldinger technique. That was the, you know, the standard uh, uh, method that had been used. You risk getting some leakage with each of those exchanges. So we want to eliminate over the wire exchanges, and we want to be able to access and release our stent with one device. Um, we're using cautery microwires here to, to optimize the cutting component, namely um, penetrating through the wall while minimizing the coagulation component which may injure the surrounding tissue. This needs to be endosonographer controlled. So in contrast to our luminal stents, our tubular stents, which can be deployed by the assistant, this must be deployed by the endosonographer because there is no room for error. We're dealing with a very, very short stent that just straddles the wall, so the distal and proximal flanges must be very precisely placed. And it is this part of the handle that is uh, the, the critical part of the, uh, uh, of, of the delivery concept, which is to independently deploy the distal and the proximal flange. So each flange must be, we must be able to deploy it separate from the other. So it's a two-step release process. Um, and you only deploy the proximal flange after you are certain that the distal flange is in a correct position. This is, uh, of course, lure lock to the echo endoscope, no different than an FNA needle. And there's no learning curve because the endosonographer is already uh, used to uh, controlling the handle, him or herself. Uh, so this is just an adaption of that basic uh, technique. Um, this study was just published in 2016, which uh, specifically reviewed the outcomes of drainage and debridement of Waldorf necroses using the axial stent. So the axial stent was used in all of these patients, um, and all of the patients had Waldorf necroses. So we're excluding pseudocysts. 124 patients, it's a multi-center trial. Um, it is a retrospective trial, however. Debridement through the lambs was, uh, was performed in 63%. Let me take you through this algorithm here. We have 124 patients. The technical success, just deploying the stent, was 100%. So that's great. Now, the complete resolution at three months was 86%. But noteworthy is that complete resolution was achieved in one session, and that one session was not a debridement session, it was a drainage session, session because the operators placed the stent first and only did the debridement in a later session. So that was possible in uh, almost a third of the patients. Um, the remaining two thirds then required debridement through the lambs. Nasal cystic irrigation was used in 18%, that was at the discretion of the endoscopist. Reinterventions after the first month were required in 7%. So, you know, the majority of these cavities, these wands, uh, resolved uh, within a month. Most of the adverse events, uh, there was an 18% adverse event rate, but most of these were not related to the axial stent at all. They were related to the underlying disease, the pancreatitis and the Waldorf necroses. Some of the bleeding that you see here, this occurred during the debridement. This is my personal endoscopic step-up approach for wands. If I have a patient with infected or, uh, or septic, infected necroses or, inf or septic clinically, 
uh, and or has heavy necroses, then I will always place a nasal cystic catheter for irrigation. I'm limited to three days simply because patients don't tolerate the irrigation for longer than three days, or at least you have to give them a break. So after three days, we remove the nasal cystic catheter, but then we perform weekly debridements until full resolution. I do think that these weekly debridements, they can be performed very quickly through the axial stent um, and allows us to um, uh, clean out any residual debris. We're only removing loose debris. We're, we're not uh, trying to clean out any adherent necroses. Uh, if we have light necroses or the patient's an outpatient or simply refuses or is not likely to tolerate a nasal cystic catheter, meaning they may, you know, uh, 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 may, may pull the nasal cystic catheter out, then uh, in that case we'll just place the stent, but we will perform vigorous irrigation with at least a liter as well as add hydrogen peroxide for chemical debridement until the cavity is clean and we will still have the patients come back weekly to have quick checks. Now, we may not need to do anything. Um, we'll generally leave the axios in for a month before removal to allow the entire cavity to start to granulate down. So um, it's not enough that it's clean. We want it to start to granulate and close down. I'm gonna show you two examples. The first is using nasal cystic catheter irrigation. Uh, as mentioned, this would be for any patient who is septic, uh, or has um, uh, infected necroses. You can see hot axios entry. You can see the deployment of the distal flange under EUS guidance, um, and afterwards deployment of the proximal flange under endoscopic drain uh, guidance, and you will see drainage of pus. So this is uh, heavily infected. We send that off for culture. Uh, we enter into the cavity after dilating up the lumen of the uh, 15 millimeter axios, you can see that there's some necroses. We will uh, uh, irrigate out the cyst uh, very uh, vigorously with, uh, with saline uh, followed by hydrogen peroxide. And then we'll place our nasal cystic catheter through the axial stent. Uh, we wanna have the pigtail end as deep into the cavity as possible. <coughs> And then we will retract the endoscope as we advance our catheter in a one-to-one -one fashion. And we're gonna leave that in for three days, remove it, and then a week later we'll come back and take a look. And in this patient, actually everything resolved with just three days of nasal cystic catheter irrigation. This is a second example where we follow the endoscopic step-up approach. We start with drainage, and then we move only to serial debridement if necessary. This patient was in the ICU for over a month. You can see that we have a, a, a walled off collection here. So a very typical wand. And in this video, again, you'll see the, uh, in the advancement of the uh, hot axials delivery uh, uh, system and then deployment of the distal frange. There's about uh, a third of the lumen occupied with necroses. We are deploying the proximal flange. The contents here are clear, more clear. They're not infected. Uh, we dilate up the tract, we enter into the cavity. Just like the last case, you can see about a third of the cavity is filled with necroses. We do, again, the same with uh, uh, vigorous irrigation, uh, hydrogen peroxide. Now we bring the patient back on day seven. We did not place a nasal cystic catheter in this patient, and we do the debridement. You can see there's necroses. Some of it is trying to extrude out of the lumen of the stent, and we extract the loose necroses in this case with a rat tooth forceps, that's my uh, instrument of choice, but you can use uh, snares and baskets as well. Uh, and we tease this out of the cavity and we let it uh, loose in the stomach lumen. And we'll do that until we can get out all of the loose, uh, uh, easily removable necroses, irrigate again, and then uh, we will bring the patient back uh, a week after that again. You can see the second debridement here. Once again, same technique take out as much of the loose necroses as possible. As a rule, we're not spending more than 15, 20 minutes with any of these cases. This is our third debridement now on day, uh, what is it, 20, uh, 25, and you can see that we are grabbing the end of a, uh, a, look, a, a tail of necroses that is uh, uh, extruding through the axial stent, and we're able to tease that clump out of the cavity, and so here it is, and we release it. So.
uh, a nice big chunk. And when we go back to look inside, um, and this is now uh, day 32, you can see that we have nice granulation tissue. The cavity is collapsed. So not only is it clean, but there's good granulation tissue. Now we're ready to remove the axial stent. So we remove the axial stent, very easily comes out, and we can then pop one more time through the cyst gastrostomy opening without the axials now. You can see the granulation tissue. The cavity is completely collapsed down. And this patient uh, literally could be discharged the next day. You can see the CT scan before and after with just one month of treatment using the endoscopic step-up approach. So here are my conclusions. I'd like to begin uh, as I did this, our, my talk with, uh, with an emphasis of the definition of WAN. Firstly, age more than four weeks since onset of acute pancreatitis. Second, a mature wall. Thirdly, contents consisting of both uh, liquid and solid material. Mainly liquid, uh, but if there's any solid, then uh, we call it a WAN. The lumen opposing metal stent enables a single device treatment from beginning to end. So it enables a step-up approach that starts with drainage, and then only if necessary, we can move on to debridement. Um, we can do that all through the stent that was originally placed. So we're using it as a port for a debridement. So we, we don't need to replace stents as we used to. And if you use the electrocautery enhanced system, then you can do this all without even any kind of wire, over the wire exchange. Uh, we can do it uh, with, a, with immediate deployment of our stent after accessing the cavity. Nasal cystic irrigation uh, was a key part of the Dutch pancreatitis group protocol and um, I am also a strong believer in nasal cystic irrigation. Uh, uh, the, the limitation obviously is that it is something that patients don't want, um, and uh, there's a, a compliance issue. I would say if you have infected necroses or a heavy necrotic load, uh, place a nasal cystic catheter. Uh, you can limit it to just three days. That usually is sufficient to really clean out the cavity. But if you can't perform nasal cystic catheter irrigation, then consider weekly serial debridements until resolution. And my practice is to bring these patients back weekly. And the reason is because this is like a quick EGD. And I think that the price you pay if you wait until the patient develops infection and maybe becomes septic, that doesn't always happen, obviously. But when it happens, it can be very dramatic. So I think it's wiser to bring the patient back for a quick check to make sure that things are resolving nicely and there's no super infection that may be incurring, occurring. This concludes my talk. Thank you very much.